So when an exhibition opens at an art museum, typically a few days before, they hold an event that is called a press preview. Now the idea behind a press preview is to invite members of the press to come down to see the exhibition, take images, shoot video, talk to curators, and build stories around this that hopefully they will run in the media to promote the exhibition by the time it opens. This morning is the press preview for Irving Penn's Beyond Beauty in Dallas, and I've been invited, and I've also been invited to bring you guys along with me. So come on, we're going to Dallas to see Irving Penn. Except for one, Penn did the first black and white photo cover for Vogue, and we have that wonderful uh, cover there as well. What I love about this image is it's one of those key images that is in a style that may not last very long for Penn, but yet it sweeps together a lot of things he had been thinking about and a lot of things that he would think about more. And so it's a portrait, it's a still life, and it has that wonderful strain of surrealism. And it was done for a magazine article about this actress. Margaret Sullivan was at the time one of the stars um, in Broadway. And it was a new play that had just opened called The Voice of the Turtle, where she plays this very curious and sexually precocious young girl. And that's the theme of it. And so what Penn has done in this picture totally styled by Penn, is given us the elements of a surreal still life. I mean, what that hammer is doing, um, not breaking the egg. So we've got an egg and we've got a hammer and we've got some sort of medieval looking glass thing and we've got drawers that are partially open with stuff coming out of them all very broad. But, and, but it's, as a portrait, it's kind of odd because she's not square in the center of it and in fact she seems to be hiding behind this other thing. So she's somewhere in the middle ground but there's stuff going on in the background but he's also kind of revealed this studio setup he's kind of deconstructed it right so it's not we, we sort of see how the parts were put together which is kind of amazing for that time no one sort of did that well, sort deconstruction of is something we've seen throughout i mean even the corner portraits yes. are classic deconstruction right so this is just a little before he starts those corner portraits mm -hmm. so he's obviously playing with um, sort of flats in the studio to set it up. And then he gives us other kinds of clues. So there's a picture of a turtle in it. Voice of the Turtle is the name of the play. And we've got this odd little child drawing here. And then even behind it is this some sort of bird on the wall. Penn loves, by the way, to put pictures into photographs as, I mean, they're like pictograph kinds of things. So, so here we have this deconstructed picture of portrait of, of Margaret Sullivan and um, it's got all of those elements um, and it just seems to be like so provocative and odd um, and it's that perversion that Penn kind of loved to add into a picture of not making it perfect and so right after this is when he begins those corner portraits where he just strips the studio bare puts those two flats together and makes people perform in them. He ultimately abandons this as a style of working. He said it was just way too complicated. So, way too complicated. So let's just get the person and the flats and just see what happens. Having a background in graphic design, and one of the things that I really think that separates Penn and probably was behind much of the innovation he did is that way of thinking like a designer conceptually, um, using metaphor at times, using things like that. Was there anything you noticed about, in knowing him, just his way of thinking like that? Was he kind of a creative thinker, or what I was think he like? I was a terms? very creative thinker. I think he was always sort of pushing, let's see, let me, 
I, I'm not going to say he was pushing the limits, but what he did is he defined his style, and then he pushed the the um, he pushed the the picture within the limits of that style. So I think what you get is the power of resistance as much as just breaking free. It's sort of this compression feeling that you get as part of Penn's power. Um, he. He was meticulous. He was very analytical, I think. Um, he, he did a lot of preparatory sketches. I won't call them real drawings, but sketches, laying out um, a, a still life or a, or a fashion shoot. Um, so he thought about it ahead of time. It wasn't very spontaneous, um, but he really thought, what is the image that I want to, what's the idea, and how can I make that happen. Um, there are just wonderful notes from his uh, longtime studio uh, manager um, that exist in the archive of Penn's work at the Art Institute of Chicago. A lot of written day journal kinds of notes that she had. And just um, Penn sort of like sending hats back. Not the right hat, not the right hat, not the right hat. Don't send a model with bangs. I don't want bangs in this picture. Um, he did all kinds of things. Like, he was extremely meticulous about. Yeah, there was. The uh, there are just wonderful anecdotal things, such as um, he had to put a lemon in a in a photograph, and so they had to send. Oh, the the joke was that you had to get 500 lemons yeah. for him to choose one that he would take 500 <laughs> photographs of. <laughs> That's amazing. So, so there's that kind of rigor and attention to detail, but also um, a demand for yeah. perfection that met his standards. You know, I'm not sure that um, everybody who does that kind of work now gets the kind of control that um, a handful, Annie Leibovitz, Stephen Meisel, right. Mario Testino, yeah, I mean, they're, they're designing it, but, um, you know, I'm not sure that except at that level, which gives us sense. Penn was at that level. He was yeah. Penn. Indeed, I was um, very fortunate to know Mr. Penn. I first did an exhibition when I was curator at the American Art Museum at the Smithsonian in, gosh, the early 90s. And um, one of the things that's interesting about Mr. Penn is once you know him, you know him for a long time. So it was one day, um, I was there, it was late in the day, and I was putting my coat on. And Mr. Penn said to me, you might be interested in seeing these. And when somebody like Mr. Penn says, you might be interested in seeing these, you don't say, gotta go. You say, <laughs> I'll take my coat off and let's look at these. Uh, so he opened up box after box of what turns out to be now a selection in this exhibition of his very earliest work. These um, small um, square format, made with a small Rolleiflex photographs that he made as his very first photographs as a young um, assistant for Alexei Brodovich at Harper's Bazaar. When he got his first camera, he began walking the streets of New York and making um, photographs mostly of shop windows, um, of curious signs of things on the street. He was, for a brief period of time, a street photographer. I think that they were friends, but they were very competitive friends. Um, the competition really heated up when Diana Vreeland left Harper's Bazaar and came to be um, editor at Vogue and brought along her favorite photographer at Harper's, who was Avedon. Mm -hmm. And so for um, a good period of time, they worked, they worked together. Now, it also seems to be a period of time when Penn <coughs> spent less and less time um, uh, photographing uh, in the Vogue studio and more and more time traveling to exotic places to photograph. So there, there is that. But I can tell you that um, when we did the Penn show, and I did it in the early 90s, um, I came around the corner one day and found Richard Avedon very <laughs> surreptitiously looking at the show. And, uh, Avedon was very um, was very uh, insistent that Penn see his show when it went to the Whitney, and, and Penn sort of say, "Oh, I'll get to it next week. I'll get to it next week." And um, Avedon was just totally agitated, but Penn did go. And Radovich pushed them to think, amaze me, sort of, what's different? How can I do this? But he also was very good at talking about 
the, this notion of, of the perversion in a picture. The Brodovich actually would use the word poison. Huh. What's the drop of poison that um, makes the story interesting? That makes the beautiful woman eat the apple and fall into the swoon. You guys, that was pretty amazing. And I want to give a special thanks to the Dallas Museum of Art and to my friend Sue Canterbury for allowing me to come out and film a little bit this morning. And I didn't do a lot of talking here because I really wanted uh, Mary Forrester uh, to do a lot of the talking. She is amazing. She is a former curator at the Smithsonian Museum and she is absolutely brilliant. And I think this was a lot of fun. One of the things that I wasn't able to probably get on video is the print quality. And the, one of the things that I'm most stunned by in this exhibition is how good a printer um, Irving Penn really was. He was really outstanding. And so I did some close-ups of some things, especially on the Platinum Palladiums. These are things you need to see in person, and that is one of the biggest challenges in doing this show, is that it's all done through video. And you guys that signed up to come to the meetup, we sold out, and I'm really excited about that. I've got people traveling in to do it. You're gonna get to see it. If not, I highly recommend you guys come see the show. It is at the Dallas Museum of Art, and I gotta go look up the dates. I don't know them offhand, but I'll put them below. Um, go see this while you can. It is outstanding. It's an outstanding show from one of the great photographers of our time, and well worth traveling to see. As always, if you guys enjoyed this video, remember to hit the like button and share it with your friends and as always subscribe to the art of photography so you'll always be up to date on all the latest and greatest stuff see you guys in the next video later